Go, test. Test, test. Test son, test son. Test, t, 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 et c.
ça marche. C'est bon C'est bon là, ce qu'on m'entend Ok. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Loïc, for coming to HTC. I know it's far, and we're really pleased to have you. Uh, it's actually funny because uh, Loïc met the HTC Entrepreneur in San Francisco about two weeks ago, and uh, so I saw that uh, on Twitter because he said that it was really it was a really good time for him to talk to HTC entrepreneurs. And I myself, I was uh, going to Sciences Po, and I was really feeling down because it was raining. So I just said, oh, come on, I'm so jealous. And he actually answered right away, hey, why don't we organize a conference in Paris uh, next time I come? So I said, hey, that's a great idea. So that explains why you're all here today. Um, so uh, actually, we want this to be an interactive uh, masterclass. So thanks to our partner, uh, Wisenbly, uh, we are going to, well, to have a, an interactive class. So you can ask questions, comments on what's happening, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll try to take your questions. So to ask questions, uh, you can either do it by text message. So you just send a text message to 31035. You can put that right away. Uh, it's totally free, of course. And you just type Loïc HEC and then your question. And it's going to appear on the screen, and it will appear on my iPad, and I'll ask the question right away to reach. So you can also do this uh, by web uh, or by Twitter, uh, which is the easiest. So you just put the hashtag uh, Loïc HC, and uh, we'll see your comments on the wall. OK? Awesome. So, so Loïc. Thanks, Pino. So tell me. And we're doing this in English, yeah? Of course. <laughs> All right. Because we're in international school. I, I, I can barely speak English. Uh, that's too bad for someone living in. No, thanks for organizing this and thanks all for coming on a, on a Friday afternoon at 5.30 in Paris. In Paris. Yeah, and we have, uh, we have uh, a few hundred people that just joined the live so it's cool. And many more people in the traffic, but they'll soon be here, I hope. <laughs> so. So uh, tell me, you, you graduated uh, from HEC in 1996. So uh, what were your aspirations at that time? What were you expecting? And what has been happening in your life since? You want me to talk about Well, about, about your life. life I mean, yeah. No, not in general. I mean, <laughs> just what are the major steps in your life and how did it make yeah, you? Yeah, so I, um, well, I had, um, I, uh, <laughs> let's see, where do I start? I, I was a student HEC. at HEC at HEC Entrepreneur and uh, uh, at the time it was not, you, you had to, you could not start a business while you were on campus. I, I think now you can uh, during the major. But uh, I, so I, I started a bit my first business not telling anyone because Robert Papin at the time who created a chance entrepreneur he didn't want us to do that. So and I, I had I was driven by two things. One was to uh, to start a business, and I, I never worked for anyone else than, than me. And I think I I, I will probably never. Uh, I, I'd rather have a I don't know sell flowers or something, uh, sell anything. Have a shop or a restaurant, than work for someone else. That's just you know, just and then nothing against people working for other people. Just say it's just you know a state of mind. And uh, and I wanted to have something to do with new technologies, of course, and and the internet. So so that's how I started, and I I, I was fascinated with the internet in. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we want to go there, but like '93. Did, did the so. internet actually exist at that time? <laughs> There was no iPhone for sure, uh, but uh, the <laughs> it started for me in '93 in uh, first year in an internship year, and I, I saw uh, I, I I could do uh, literally could go around the whole internet on uh, a browser called Mosaic at the time, and uh, Yahoo was the first uh, directory, and it was it was called David Philo's and, and Jerry Young's homepage, and I remember doing the whole tour of the internet. You could see it all. 
in a few hours. You would just click. Anyway, and, and so I, I saw, I didn't see what would come, but I saw a huge potential, and I, I did a study that would dedicate everything I do to that. And uh, at Ashes Entrepreneur, I did this, uh, an internship, which was at Peugeot, the cars. And, um, and, and there, I told them they should do the first dealership, a car dealership, uh, sell cars on the internet in, uh, what was it, 93 or something. And, um, and they said, great, you should do it. We would like to hire you at the end of the internship. And I said, no, how about you become my customer and I start my business. And that was during HS Entrepreneur. And so I started a web agency uh, with the remainings of my students' loan. Which I had, I had no money. I mean, I mean, enough to just start this. And but I had a first contract from Peugeot, and we started to do this website, and we were happy. And then they uh, recommended me to another brand, Elida Fabergé, who recommended me to Chanel. So I did the first uh, Chanel.com website, uh, and so on and so forth. And I ended up with uh, an agency called uh, B2L, B2L, and uh, sold it to uh, BBDO Group in uh, a few years after, where which is where I, 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 it's my first exit. So I, I, I made some money and I was still very young and um, I had a little bit more hair than now. And I started a second company then, which was a web hosting company um, called, um, you want me to go up to now? I'll, I'll do it really quick. So I started a second company uh, that was, so the web agency was targeted at large brands. So Chanel and so were very expensive. Um, and I wanted to do something for small businesses because they would keep calling and we would not be able to serve them because we were too, ex we were luxurious, we were, you know, we we're doing Chanel and Peugeot, so, you know. And so I, I set up another company called RapidSite, which uh, uh, was web hosting and uh, we were one of the first to introduce what we call web, shared web hosting, so free, if, uh, not free, but cheap web hosting in France um, and uh, sold this to France Telecom. Uh, it became part of one I do that you have never heard of because, yeah, probably. And I did, I did that with my wife, Charlene. We've been partners and working together uh, since the beginning. And then uh, that's 2000, the bubble happened. So I, I made some money because I sold those two companies and I thought I was invincible. I thought I could do anything. Not anymore. I don't think that anymore. And I started being crazy, basically. It was the 2000 internet bubble, as we call it. So I started investing and I started to start three startups at the same time, just because one was not enough, right? It was too easy. Obviously, yeah. Right. And so everything failed and I lost a lot of money and I invested in many companies where I, I lost also a lot of money. Uh, that was uh, for a few years. I learned the hard way that it was not that easy, uh, which is great. It's the best. When you fail, that's where you learn the most. And then I started blogging. I learned blogging. Um, I was invited to, I was lucky enough to be invited to the World Economic Forum in Davos, which uh, has a program for young people. And, um, and I can tell you how you get invited to that if you like. That and uh, that changed my life. It took, it took a totally different direction when I met a friend called Joe Ito. Joe is the head of the MIT Media Lab now. Um, and uh, he taught me blog blogging. 2003 in Davos, he was sitting next to me, and he was uh, blogging a, a session, and I, I, I couldn't, I didn't get it. 2003, right? I, I was like, "What are you doing?" And he was typing live on his blog and posting, which to you sounds natural, but wasn't at the time. And he started posting this and getting comments, and I was like, "What is that?" And they're like, "Oh, this guy is commenting from Japan, and this guy from the US, and this guy." And I was, like, "Wow, I." Tell me, teach me, and and I started to basically take Joey apart and spend the evenings learning blogging. I I, I need to do this right now, and I started my blog, um, and that changed my life because that's where I started to share a lot, uh, a lot of yes, but a lot of cool things as well, and started to get a, a dialogue going on online in a community, and I started a company uh, uh, which was one of the first to run blogging in, in Europe by. Uh, uh, acquiring a, a small service called Ublog at the time, and then grew it and uh, sold it to a, a company called Six Apart, which was then sold, and I won't get into too many details, but it was a, one of the first blogging services, uh, just because I, I had so much passion with it that I wanted to make it my job. And that's a, advice for you guys. I, I mean, a tip, if, if you 
do something, if you start a business which is your passion, it makes everything very easy because you don't feel like you're working. You feel like you're just doing your passion. And that's something I'm, I'm still trying to do. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, and then, <laughs> if that's okay. And then uh, I, I did the, um, so I, I wanted to promote blogging and help entrepreneurs. So that's when I started the conference that is now called The Web. And I, I, it was called Liblog at the time, just because I wanted to, to be fun, you know, like the Big Mac with cheese in, in uh, oh, that's Pulp Fiction. Why. Yeah. Oh, that's why. Okay. That's why. Liblog. I thought it was like Le Meur, Le Web. No, no. No, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm very egocentric, but not that <laughs> not bad. Not that much? Okay. No, no. I thought so. It, it was, uh, no, no, it was about uh, Le Big Mac, which is like okay. a joke, right? Like a French touch. And my goal was to, of course, promote blogging at the time, but also uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, I was very aware of the issues of entrepreneurs of mine, which was one that if you're in Paris, it's very difficult to be international. So I did an event which was entirely in English, and we did it at the Senate. They gave us a room uh, where we, we we were 200 people, but 15 countries, and um, uh, uh, we didn't do any French translation. And I started uh, some press controversy at the time because I said, if, if you don't speak English, it's not for you, because uh, you cannot, you won't be able to interact with speakers and people here. So don't 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 like don't bother if you're. If you want to come, you don't speak English. And the, the Senate, which is a cool story, but the management of the French Senate showed up and, and, and said, hey, uh, you have French translation, right? I said, no, why? And the guy looked at me and said, well, by law, you have to have French translation. You cannot do an event here in English only. And I said, and we kept going. And that started controversy. So 200 people showed up. Um, and we did, so we did another one. And the idea was to help entrepreneurs. So international, uh, have the best people in the world come to Europe because I was so frustrated everything happened in Silicon Valley. I was in Paris, but I was frustrated. So we got, I really tried really hard, but if you have the ambition of, of uh, the goal was to have the best people in the world. If you have that ambition, then somehow you make it happen. So we had Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, launched Square in Paris at the web then became the web. Uh, we had Chad Olive, the founder of YouTube, we had Eric Schmidt, we had, you know, I, I mean, name dropping, but a lot of cool people. It took me a lot of work at my wife, Charlene, and we, uh, um, and it grew from 200 to 500, 800, now it's 5,000 people in Paris and London. It's a great business. We didn't think about it as a business at all, and now it's a great business. And last but not least, uh, I did, um, I did a company called Sismic, which is probably the one where I learned the most because it's been extremely challenging uh, for me and my team, and, and which was uh, initially a video conversation because I was really, uh, I, if you look at talk shows on TV, you, you know those debates, like for example, political debates where you have a left wing and the right wing and they argue, or you have a topic and so on. Uh, I wanted that to happen on the internet. It still does not happen today. Um, and, and so I launched this with this you know, goal in mind, and it picked at 100,000 users only who wanted to interact in video. We had an amazing community, insane community there of people who started to know each other, creating connections that I've never seen anywhere else, but it never became big. Uh, so, we, so I had to pivot, as we say, and I pivoted into a Twitter app, uh, and then Twitter started deciding basically that uh, we couldn't do what we were doing, um, as I posted on, on LinkedIn recently. And, um, and so I had to pivot again, and we, we finally sold the company. That, that, that was not uh, the success I hoped. And, uh, but I learned a lot. And, and now I, uh, I still run the web. We sold it. So last year I sold CCP and the web. And, uh, but I still run it, and I'm still intending on running it, the program. That's it. And I also invest in about 20 companies. Okay. 25. 80% are dead. 10% um, are uh, okay. 5% are doing very well. And one was LinkedIn. Nice one. Um, so, what would be your advice to a young HCC entrepreneur today that just finished the school and doesn't know what to do? Should you leave? Should you stay? What would be your advice? Uh, you want an honest answer? or you Yeah, honest. Uh, I'm not going to say no, I want a dishonest answer. Please tell us to stay. No, I think it's kind of sad to tell students of the best 
business school in France that they should leave the country, right? Kind of sad, so I cannot say that. Oh, I mean, you can give advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think Do you so. really think they should leave or? Look, I, um, I, I started a few businesses here. I, I, I sold them, I made money. I, so you can succeed in France. And I think HSA is a fantastic course. <laughs> What else should I say, right? It's a fantastic school. I should say entrepreneur is amazing. And uh, hi, Bernard. And, uh, and Robert. And really, no, it's great. Um, and you can succeed in here. And, and you can see Xavier Niel and Jacques Antoine Grandjean and all those. You can do something huge. I was having dinner with Xavier yesterday. And I'm so impressed. Uh, and so you can stay. And if you talk to Xavier, he's, he's in France. He loves it. And you can succeed in. Anything else and technology, also fashion, and, and there is so much. Now, having said that, I think if you're interested in technology, um, Silicon Valley is probably the best just because it feels like a campus pretty much here that you never leave university because you, uh, like, I, I do a lot of kite surfing, and if you go to Third Avenue where kite surfing, uh, you, you have a, a guy from Facebook launching your kite and someone from Google helping you. So it's, it's, it's like a campus. Uh, I live on a campus. You know, you have to like that because you keep, you stay with geeks all day long, basically. So if you're looking for like French fashion and sophisticated, uh, you know, way of uh, life like in, in Paris, maybe not for you. If you are looking at uh, being at the center of Silicon Valley and, and, and I, like I have Twitter a block away and I can drive to Facebook in 20 minutes. For me, it's amazing. Which is just a question. I mean, from when you're from HSA and you're French, uh, you don't just go in the United States that way. I mean, you have visa. You have a you can just go in the Silicon Valley and start your business. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. I mean, uh, Charles is, is where is Charles? Here is a is a former uh, intern of mine, and he came uh, right after. Uh, no, actually, before graduating as an intern, you can get a, an internship visa very easily. Right, super easy to get. So your advice would be to get an intern get, visa. I mean, then? get so you have my advice. I have tons of advice, uh, but um, one is uh, take risks because you're you're going to have kids and family and of course and and be in charge of many things that depend on you. Right now, it's the time to to do it because you don't you can fail. Who cares? No, no one like it's okay. Just just you know start. Like Papin says, I have to say it in French, but jeter les halos is apprend à nager. So for them in, in the ocean, and they'll learn how to swim. And uh, and and that's you know that that's the key. So so just try things and don't be afraid of failure. It's it's okay if you fail. And I just posted about failure. It can post write about failure. And it's fine. I, I don't know. It's very French to be afraid of. Failure. And, and so that's my first advice is, uh, is do it. Two, try to have an international, I, I think it's amazing, it's great to have an international uh, environment. And the problem in Europe, not in France, is that if you live in Paris, that was my experience. My first business was very, not even French, Parisian. It was an agency. And I, I in Paris, I had a month of my lunches booked in advance, right? That's how you, we, you do business here. You have lunch. Uh, it takes two hours, and you go have lunch, right? And uh, in Silicon bad. Valley, the lunch is half an hour in a sandwich. And, you know, that's a very different culture. We should talk about that too. It's fun to, to, to compare that. Like it's all about efficiency. And here, it's all here. You try to know people first, and then you tell them what you want or what you might want. There, you tell them what you want first, and if they don't want it, they tell you immediately, or if they can't help you, and you, you shouldn't be uh, surprised or frustrated. If you call someone and ask for something, he says, I can't, I don't have time to meet you. Here, no, you do a lunch, and it's very different like uh, way of doing doing business, which is nice to see. But anyway, an international environment, the problem here is I, I had, you have lunch with French journalists, and then uh, maybe, you know, uh, French politicians, and you start to be in a very Parisian um, small circle, and you stay there, and you can thrive, no problem. But I realized that with my first company, when I tried to be French, so, so so the hosting company was more nationwide, and then I tried to go Europe and so on. And the, thing, the problem is, if you start something here, you, you you keep thinking French, and that's it's normal because you're in France after all. 
But by the time you do this, someone in Silicon Valley will probably raise more money and, and reach a market of, you know, 250 million people instead of 60 and, and so on and, and uh, get more funding. And then, uh, so t take Daily Motion and YouTube. Uh, I think Daily Motion was started even before YouTube. Um, and it's a success, no question. And, and Marisa Mayar, my, my friend, might, might be buying it right now. I don't know, it's rumors. But um, YouTube is what it is. It's an absolute leader acquired by Google. Daily Motion is a success, but got you know, a long time and it, it's not, not as much. Not the same. That's my point. And, and so it can only help you think, you know, bigger. And also, another advice, I'll just show up like in random format. I hope it's okay. But um, don't think really big. Like for the web, I wanted the leaders of the world on stage. And when I was saying that, people were making fun of me. It's okay. You know, it's like if you start a business, people will make fun of you, saying you're going to fail, and it's okay. You don't pay attention, just keep going. Uh, and and if, if your goal is to be the leader of Paris, well, you can only reach that goal. Because then you'll reach that goal and you'll say, okay, what do I do next? If your goal is to be the leader in the world, you might not reach it. But at least you try, and you have this in mind. And I know this sounds like a lot of BS. I, I was in like your shoes, of course, and I would hear people say that, and I would say that's all BS. Yeah, that's stupid to say. That. But it, it's the truth. Like the web became my conference. I think became number one. Well, whatever. A very important. <laughs> yeah, number one in many ways. But it's because we got Eric Schmidt and Karl Lagerfeld and Jack Dorsey and, and not the French leaders or the German leaders or the Spanish leaders. I could have done that as well, but no, I decided I want the best in the world and will not settle for less. And it took me 10 years, but now we're there. I, I think we can get pretty much anyone to speak. Uh, I, I, I tried, there are some people that don't, like I, I, if you can help Richard Branson, for example, I can't get him. I might fix that through kites or thing. I'm, I'm working on it. But the last uh, quote I had was $250,000 for him to speak, and we don't pay anyone. So. Oh, you don't pay? No, we don't pay. Okay. No, we, we don't pay. We bring uh, 80 countries, the most influential audience you, you, you can dream of. Um, it's number one on Twitter as a trend. So, so anyway, B, I think international is, helps. And it's not French, like in Germany, it's the same. Everything much German and Spaniards think too much. It's a European thing. Very difficult to, to okay. go through that. And, and I hope I don't um, show up as, a, you know, this is just a genuine, like it's a way of, if you think you want to be the world leader, you will very likely fail, but at least you try. If you, if you want to be the Paris leader, then yeah, the best you can do is that. So yeah, talking about that, what, what would be the key mistake young entrepreneurs should avoid, according to you? So they can fail, that's all right, but I mean, what mistakes can... Listening to people who say they will fail. Okay. Because that's fine. Um, then, um, uh, the key mistakes. Uh, who they partner with is very key. I would avoid doing a startup with free HSA. Totally avoid that. Just because we're, you're generally the same, uh, the same. Uh, Book files. Thank you. Okay, so that's the. Is, is that, <laughs> that's one. I would avoid. Uh, so try to get uh, an engineer, and first the VCs like that. If you raise money, so try to get an engineer. Try to get, uh, uh, especially if you're not technical like me, you kind of suck by default. Yeah, that was my right? question. So, I mean, what's the added value of? Someone from HEC, I mean, great people, but like non-technical people. So when you start up, you, you, you start a startup, it's what is for you the added value of um, non-technical people? Well, I think you team. guys graduating from HEC uh, are you're smart. You went through a lot of, uh, you know how to work. Uh, mm -hmm. Class Preparatoire is it's an amazing school that I'm really happy that I went through because when you've done that, you can also work um, 20 hours a day on a startup or, okay, 17, 16, because you learn that during the prepa. And, and that is, those are qualities which are, which are really, really great. But yeah, I mean, if you're not coding, yeah. you start weak. Yeah. Okay. And I think um, most governments should encourage 
young people to learn coding very early. I'd like to learn coding, but it's a little late, I, I guess. Um, and uh, and then it's a weakness because you'll be you'll have engineers telling you things that you don't understand. You will have engineers telling you it's coming next month and six months after it's never there. You will have uh, so so you're in a weak position. But you learn management skills. What you learn here is uh, very helpful. You learn how to speak. You are generally charisma by doing all those parties and you you connect, you network, and that's a very important thing. I, I think. Uh, uh, you, you can build uh, success by being able to connect and present, and um, and, and and that's that's very key, uh, key strength. But try to get different profiles together. Try to um, uh, try to be careful with whom you partner. Finding your uh, your partners. It's a mistake I made uh, very early. Is I uh, partnered with. Uh, other people who took uh, too much, too big share of a company, and then if they don't do anything, you regret the whole company. You you, you regret that, and then you try to buy back buy back their shares, and so it's, it's complicated. It's very difficult. So don't go too fast on, on that one. If you have an idea, don't start splitting a third, third, third because there's three of us. That, that doesn't work this way. There is no egalité. <laughs> For uh, you know, it's not because there's three of us that you should have a further, further, further. For example, it's just like we tend. I tend. I I, I was like doing it too fast. Um, and w what else? I wouldn't. I would be careful with raising funding as well. I think there is a lot of value in trying to do a lot of things with very little money. And you can do a lot now, a lot more than 20 years ago. Um, with Amazon EC3, you can host for you know, pretty much for free your services. You can you can really do a lot for for pretty much nothing. You you don't need millions anymore to raise a, an app or you know. Uh, about that, um, so um, for HEC people, would you advise students to start their own company directly after HEC, or maybe gain some startup work experience first? Because that's a I, question for a lot of people. The experience doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I, I think you're, it's better that you're very fresh, and uh, I mean, it might, yes, it matters, but it, does, it shouldn't be a showstopper. I think it's uh, actually a must to uh, to not think about experience. If you, most of my friends who succeeded, like building huge services, had no clue of the sector they started in. So I give you an example of is he HSA? I don't know. He's French, at least. Bruno Laplanche. He started a uh, Business called Lending Club, LendingClub.com, and uh, he's in San Francisco. He's a buddy of mine. And the Lending Club is a huge success. Basically, you uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer, um, lending. So if you want to borrow ten thousand euros for your car, instead of going to your bank, that will be difficult, and, and so on. they they go in someone like me who has invested in in as an investor, and uh, you get uh, some of that money. So basically, uh, investors get about 8% return on their money, which is huge, right? I mean, there is not much services giving you 8% this year, these, these days. And then you can borrow uh, higher than that, and they get a margin. Very simple uh, service. They lent $1.5 billion, and um, he's, um, I'm an investor, so I'm really happy. That. But he's, uh, he's um, going for... Uh, He's probably going for IPO in a few years. He will go public. And if you talk to him, he had no financial uh, services experience. Zero. He knew nothing about it. Just got the idea. And most people, for most people, it's the case. They, uh, you actually see with fresh eyes. In, 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 to our very little um, extent, we knew nothing about the conference business. With my wife Jali, and and now um, after ten years, I think we know a thing or two. But it's um, we started without knowing anything. We forgot the coffee at the first of the web, which was the book. We forgot the coffee. Everybody complained, and uh, we learned the hard way that uh, you know you, you, you don't coffee. do that. You need coffee. And then, for example, I learned the hard way inviting uh, politicians on stage uh, one year during the campaign in two thousand seven. I, I invited. Uh, the three candidates, and I got two to show up. I, I got Sarkozy, and I got um, uh, Bayrou. Thank you. Wow. 
from Silicon Valley, it feels so you'll start as uh, uh, far away. And I also invited Ségolène Royal for some reason she didn't come. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, but I invited her. Anyway, huge controversy. I, I became the enemy of my, my friends. Like everybody started blogging. Like I was, a, uh, I was just like the worst person on earth. And, and, and there were like probably a hundred blog posts. Uh, insulting me and that I was that the event was dead um, it took me five days to even understand what I had done and I I, I, I wasn't trying to I, I didn't mean bad I, I, I literally thought there is a presidential campaign in France I my political ideas were public on my blog so I wasn't taking anybody by uh, surprise I uh, invited the free candidates. I left the extremes on the side because I, I cannot invite either left or right extremes. I don't support that. And um, and I thought I generally think thought I was doing good. Huge controversy. People insulted me in corridors. And and what I did was um, I took all the insults and the criticism, which is a tip as well. Don't don't. If people insult you, it probably means something matters. So it's okay. It means what you're doing matters, or you know that it's important. Otherwise, they wouldn't pay attention. And so it's okay. Uh, read, and I did a blog post, which is still online, which has I think 120 answers. I took every single criticism, and I answered. Here's how I did it. Here's why I did it. And yes, I fucked. I screwed up. And uh, here is why. And I will never do it again. And and yes, blame me, and never try to avoid it. Take it like in your face and fight it. You know? So you wouldn't do it again? No. So actually those people were right? This way, it was no. a mistake? Yes, it was a huge mistake. But was it a mistake in itself, or was it a mistake because people took it badly? Uh, it was a mistake for many reasons. First, politicians are told like what they say is generally lies wherever left or right, because they're just trying to sell themselves all the time. And uh, the spirit of the web of events like that and the community that is around it and the people I live with in Silicon Valley are about the opposite. They generally tell the truth and they generally are very authentic. And if it sucks, it sucks, they tell you and so on. And, and so that was a total disconnect. You cannot impose to an audience of people like the bloggers and the uh, people on Twitter, you cannot lie. Yeah, try to lie on Twitter and tell me if it's sustainable. You will always have someone telling you, this is wrong, here's why. So you can't. So polit politicians don't get social networks at all. They're terrible at it. And it, it's the same in the US and everywhere, I would say. Because they, they take it the wrong way. They do it for a campaign. Did you notice they create their Twitter names for a campaign, uh, for the regional or for the national and, and the presidential, and then they get rid of it, which is totally wrong. You create, I'm not changing my Atloic username on Twitter every two months. I'm building a, you know, a community, and if I, if I screw up, I know I, I fix it. And, and they, they are always, so that's the first uh, uh, issue when the the second was the way I did it. It was an international audience with, at the time, 50 countries. And I, I, I get two politicians talking in French. Oh, so because in English, not that good. No, because they, convert to yeah. the, they can't. Because yeah. everybody will laugh at them yeah, if they yeah. do, right? If they speak like I speak English, you, you'll get that at, the, at Les Guignol on TV for two years, right? So they can't. I understand them. I don't blame them for that. But like getting 50 countries to listen to, to French, politicians. French politicians, and you have people like this, the translation like that's terrible. Second mistake. I mean, I could go on and on. So no, I wouldn't do it again. Or I would do an event which would be uh, transparency in politics and so on. But I think I have much better to do doing the web than doing that because the web helps entrepreneurs in a concrete way. There is not a single week that I don't get a mail from someone who got an idea, raised funding, uh, succeeded, sold his company, uh, created a thousand jobs. And that's what it is. It's not promises. It's uh, hard facts and results. And I'm very proud of what we're doing because it's concrete results. Um, and so, yeah, no, I'm not too uh, interested in politics. 
Um, so about those cultural differences between Silicon Valley and France, can you tell us a little more and maybe how to adapt to them? Yeah, are those all questions you get from the room? Yeah, exactly. That's one That's I got cool. from the Because room, we right? also have mics, right? We should take some... Uh, yeah, we'll get some questions I, after Should I disrupt you a little bit? Um, well, maybe you can answer that question first and then we'll... What the was mic. the question? So, uh, <laughs> uh, the question was... Uh, uh, to tell us more about cultural differences between Silicon yep. Valley and France and how to adapt them. Uh, there are more cultural differences between Silicon Valley and France. I would say Europe because it's kind of the same. I, no, I mean culture, right? There is a huge difference. So if, you, <laughs> if you... All right, the Swede is not the same as the Portuguese, I know. But uh, the cultural differences are kind of the same, I think, between the two. So. Um, I would say um, the culture of um, efficiency is probably the most uh, important. I give you an example. If you um, if you talk to someone, you email someone, or you call someone you, uh, in Silicon Valley, they will expect you to, to tell you what you want immediately. Immediately, like um, here, they will try to, or we will try because I'm still French, right? We will try to uh, connect first, so get to know you. And, and then, if there is, when trust is kind of established, then we will uh, uh, get to the point of what you want and if I can help or not, and so on. And that is a huge difference. So, for example, if we talk in the corridor and, and, and I, don't, I cannot understand what you want, I'll cut you and say, how can I help? Because that's the culture there. The culture is, how can I help? And I'll tell you immediately, yes, I can help. No, I can't help. Here is why. And you shouldn't be offended if it's a no, I can't help. Because uh, maybe I can help in two weeks on something else, and I will. You see what I mean? And here it's like, you know, and, you, and I think this is very European. Because it's a huge difference, which I like. And I became like, like that now. I, and sometimes I'm even a little rude. I try to avoid it. But no, it's, it's just, and I like that. You don't have like... Three personal assistants to reach someone. You can reach anyone in Silicon Valley, whatever the position is. You can really email anyone and, and, and reach anyone. So it's very different. You don't have, but you need to be no bullshit. Go straight to the point. Here is what I want. And you'd be surprised. You can get, you know, uh, super successful and, and star uh, investors get investing in your company because they, they just like you in, in the first two or three minutes. Get, you know, I got, I got Pierre Robidiard, the founder of eBay, uh, invest uh, in my company from a tweet, just one tweet. He, he tweeted me back that you know he wanted to invest, and I answered. Um, and and so it's very efficient. We don't have to know each other, uh, especially with social networks. Another uh, that I'm just thinking about it as I talk about it. Another advice is your reputation online. Um, is going to be, I think, the most valuable currency that you have. Um, and I, I think that um, your online reputation is going to be more important than any other form of power or money, financial, um, anything. It's the most important because that's how people know you and that's what precedes you. And so the way you use social networks or not, the way you use the sharing economy, or, which is kind of my thing these days, but or not, if you use Airbnb, do you put your flat uh, on it and, and are you treating people well? Everybody will know. There is a trust and a reputation that you're building for anything you do. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you drunk partying on YouTube? And, and is that bad? I, I got drunk too, uh, but it's, it's a try to avoid it. You see what I mean? It's because you're uh, someone walking with you will find that, and and uh, you can't delete it. It's not. It's impossible. Uh, a, a, I forgot his name, but it had just happened like a month ago to a startup uh, guy in Silicon Valley. Uh, Talked to actually to try to help, but he went on a trip in uh, Thailand or whatever with a group of entrepreneurs. It's called Dicks on a plane. They all go on a plane. Uh, <laughs> And they visit uh, Asia. Uh, it's cool, actually. And and he got completely drunk, like wasted. Um, you, you don't know what I'm talking about. And 
and, and his friend who didn't know what to do better uh, had the Facebook app with a video on it and it was like, you know, yeah. And I see this in my stream because I know the guy who took the video. I won't quote any names, but people from Silicon Valley will know exactly who I'm talking about. And uh, that video went, of course, on Facebook and I was like, oh my God, you know, it's like, okay, why, do you, why are you posting this? And uh, the guy was raising funding for his startup. Um, and he was uh, in trouble. He only had six to nine months of cash, if I remember well, in startup. So he was really. And the same day, he sent an email to his investors saying, It's okay, I have a situation under control. I am uh, keeping the team motivated. They don't know about it. Uh, I'm progressing fast on raising money and uh, something else. And then you see him wasted, you know, completely like. It doesn't work, and he got killed. Very difficult, you know. And so basically, his round failed. He could not raise money. I mean, a disaster. Um, and so that's a bad example. You shouldn't follow. If you make mistakes, as I, I did for the web myself, recognize them, post about them. It's okay. I mean, people will forgive you. It's fine, you know. We well, unless you kill someone or something, you go to jail anyway. But uh, if you, that's one thing. And the other thing is you build. So another tip, and I shut up for the next question, is to share on your expertise. So let's say you want to launch a company, a startup around um, um, sports, I don't know. Uh, and you're crazy about um, fencing. My son likes fencing, so that's why I'm thinking about fencing. You can blog about that, post on Facebook about that, and then share on LinkedIn and so on about this. And, and learn as you learn, you become an expert because you share, and as you share, you show your expertise, and and people will pay attention and notice and comment, and and it grows. And then you can do a talk on it, and 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 then you you get opportunities. You get people offering you jobs or internship or money, or you get people who want to partner with you. You just do freaking do something. Uh, there is um, Le Web in London, my conference. Uh, the theme is the sharing economy. And uh, there, is, uh, there are two French guys who, who do an event called We Share. We, oh, we like we. Like O U I. Um, and, um, and, and it's awesome. And they are known on the sharing economy. They got speakers from all around the world. I think it's May 1st. Here in France, I'm so impressed. And they get the best speakers to come. And I invite them to speak now at the web. And I knew nothing about them. And suddenly, they'll, so they'll speak at the web. And why? Because they just do something. So if you, if you take, here's my point, in case it's not clear. Take whatever your passion is, your expertise is, what you want to do, and start sharing about it. Uh, everything you learn, it's OK. And, and just be uh, low profile. Like my presentation on the sharing economy yesterday that I, I gave to a conference called The Next Web, I start my first slide is, I know nothing about the sharing economy. And it's a talk about the sharing economy. And that's my theme for the web. And generally, I know nothing about it. I'm learning. But here's what it is. It's uh, three months that I've been only reading about that. Books and blogs and everything I can learn. I'm like just curious for it and learning everything, sharing back links and stuff and Facebook and, and now delivering a PowerPoint um, that kind of positions me as, well, I know something. And here are the, the leaders and Etsy and Kickstarter and um, uh, Airbnb, all those guys. And, but I started saying I'm not an expert because it's just my theme for the web. In two months, I'll be focusing on something else. Anyway, you see where I'm taking this. It, you just become an expert if you start sharing. OK. Um, so we'll be taking a question from the audience. Is there any questions on the floor? You see? Better on the screen? OK. I, I don't know. I like real interaction. Like, I'm complaining about too much uh, technology. Oh, yes, here. Thank you. I have a question. It's about what you said earlier about this becoming an expert. And I'm just wondering, how do you how do you then make the difference between real experts and just pure well, crap? To yeah, be. exactly. Because it seems that everyone is put on the same level, and it's I think it's something that's difficult about the web is that you get so many information. How do you kind of well? That's ba that's back. So that's back to the reputation online you're building. 
uh, who, who, it's very very easy to uh, like like to know if a person is lying or not. So easy to to understand if he's trying to trick you and sell you something that is wrong. I give you an example, and I, I'm getting so many of those. I know it's not great, but. Uh, I get a lot of people who want to speak at the web because they know that if they speak at the web, they get 4,000 people from 80 countries listening to them, so it's cool. Um, and I have so many you have no idea who email me and they're like, I'm a TED speaker. Wow. So I stop everything I do and I, you know, wow. And, and then I, I search, I Google them and I see they spoke at, and nothing wrong with that, at TEDx. Blah. City, uh, add the city name, and it's not TED. It's great. I love TEDx. If you don't know, you know what TEDx is, right? Yeah, and it's great. It's fantastic. I would actually love to do the WebEx. It's a superb idea. But don't claim you're, speak you're the TED speaker. You're not a TED. Sp TED is the Graal, and TEDx is great, but it's different. And so my point on the expert is, uh, lies don't survive online easy. They, they don't. They die. Uh, if I tweet something wrong, I get corrected. And, uh, and and it's awesome because I learn, and then um, I I, uh, I know more about the topic. And so my point is, you check if they tweet, if they're on Facebook, what is the? I would try to get the sense of their community. Do they have uh, um, interactions? I, I don't call it a following on purpose because it's more interactions. You could have. Um, like on Google Plus, I have more than a million followers, and this is all wrong. Uh, those are bots, most of them, or new users who showed up, and I was featured there. So, so if you feature me, I'm going to get people who just add me, and they never use Google Plus a second time. And so these are wrong. But I have 100,000 on Twitter, and those I got one by one over six or seven years. And it's very, very different. So anyway, get a sense of the size. And a million doesn't mean anything. The numbers, but it gives you an idea. Then the conversation itself, do they get comments and likes? And you know, or does it look, if, if there is no conversation, it's, it sounds fake already, like very fast. Then look at the conversation. Is it, is it people helping? That's a good sign. Like if you get someone who is getting help a lot on what he publishes, that means probably he publishes for a long time. Uh, for example, politicians don't never get that kind of comments. Never. All they get is really bad comments if they get comments. Because uh, they don't have a community. And, and if I ask questions, do you, they get replies and, and so on. So very, and I will also doubt anything that looks corporate. Um, my presentation two days ago uh, in London was about how marketing was, how you should not trust marketers in front of marketers and brands. And that, that um, because if it looks too corporate and too f uh, polished, it's not genuine. Uh, look at Craigslist. Huge success, no branding, no million euro website, n nothing, but you feel it's happening. So it, it's pretty easy to learn if it's genuine or if it's fake and corporate. Generally, the more money invested on how it looks, the worst. And then tell that to the marketing, you know, Lessons here. It's, I mean, if they don't, I, I think there is uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, there's, there's a huge turning point now uh, with with uh, with marketing and authenticity, and you get it very fast. Sorry, I was a little long. I hope. I hope Thank I you. Was good. <laughs> okay. Um, is there another question? Just another one. Okay, and we'll give you back the mic afterwards. Hi, uh, I'm not from HSC. Uh, we are starting a company in uh, Hong Kong. Who, who's not from HSC? Uh. Where? <laughs> and um, now, uh, for those of you watching here, I, I got used to this on, uh, from, with the web. But we have a few hundred people. I don't know how many actually. But if you're watching, and you're not in the room. Uh, like half of the room just raised uh, their hands. Uh, so it's impressive. Thanks for uh, coming all the way to HSC. My pleasure. Um, so is it a bad idea to start a company uh, about technology uh, 
in, in China or in, in Hong Kong today because it seems that everything is going on uh, in, uh, in San Francisco or in the Silicon Valley. What I, do you think about that? I, I, have, I, have abs I don't think it's a bad idea. I have no clue. I, I okay. don't know. I, I have been to Japan twice. I have been to China three times. Uh, I'm, I'm really bad at that. I, I, I have 80 countries coming to the world, fortunately, so I learned from them. But yeah, there are huge successes everywhere around the world. Uh, and I don't think it should be a bad idea to go do it somewhere else, especially Brazil is crazy these days and, uh, and China and it's just I don't know anything about it. I can talk to you about Silicon Valley or, or Europe, but um, yeah, I have friends succeeding very well and it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, in Moscow, it's awesome. I mean, yeah. Okay, thank you. Nothing against. No, it's great. Just uh, think about one thing which we try to think about for the web because we're pinged all the time on you should launch the web in blah, in this country and so on, is uh, revenue, <laughs> right? For example, uh, I know TechCrunch, our friends there launched an event in China. And it's very tempting to launch a tech event in China because there's so much uh, uh, things happening, so many things happening there. And um, uh, people don't buy tickets because the culture of the Chinese is not yet to buying tickets at conferences. So they consider it should be free. So the revenue was really low. So if you're a conference organizer and your revenue is tickets and sponsorships and you get no sponsors because it's too early and no ticket sales because uh, the culture is not there, well, you're screwed. You're going to do one and lose money. So just pay attention to the... Uh, yeah, Africa is probably awesome, but maybe not the best you know, revenue generator. I don't know. Depends which country. So since you know the Silicon Valley well, can you tell us the next big trends in the valley entrepreneurs should focus on? Um, and it was asked, I mean, it was voted for by 11 people. So oh, you have the, a voting? Yeah, yeah, so it's not like totally That's me, cool. you know, ruling and stuff. Okay. Um, I, um, um, look, uh, I don't know in general, but I can tell you what's exciting for me. Uh, I'm getting my Google Glass on uh, Monday. Um, and I, 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 I'm so, like, actually uh, disappointed because I should have had it last Monday, so I would have it today yeah, and I will show you. Let's do that. Yes, but uh, they, uh, the appointment, they give, give you appointments to show you, uh, was at 2 p.m. and the flight was at 3 p.m., so that didn't work. Anyway, I'm very excited by Google Glass. I tried and I, uh, I could not stop using it. And so it's very cool because it's going to um, change the way you behave. Like I can talk to you and do my mail. It's cool. Oh, great. Yeah, you can scroll like <laughs> you can scroll like this and archive like this, right? Um, and delete, you know. So you so you help me like. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. Uh, forget the form factor, right? Okay. But um, I I personally think it's not a question of if; it's a question of when. And the form factor is going to be in uh, contact lenses. I mean, literally, I think we'll, we'll see that, and uh, it's cool. Like, I was walk, uh, walking in London two days ago, going back to my hotel by, by foot, and uh, I, I was like this, literally walking like this, because I didn't know. So it turns turn right, turn left, right? That, that does not... Uh, Sergey Brin says uh, it's emasculating to have a, a fun like that. Yeah, he said that at TED, actually. And that's why he did Google, guys, because at least you can, can look like a real man instead of being on your phone all the time and doing this, right? So uh, think of uh, a surgeon doing his surgery. They use checklists like pilots. Um, and so it can remind him on what to do. And, you know, it's, there's so much you can use. Yeah, there's a lot of bad things coming with it. Like uh, I had dinner with some, a friend at Google a month ago who had it on her head the whole dinner. Uh, and she, she's in the Google Glass team, so of course she wears it all day long. And I, I was, we were like, can you get them out? You know, because you don't know if it's taking a picture, you don't know if it's recording. It doesn't, it, it doesn't get read like a phone or if there's no flash, right? So you don't know. And this is, you don't want all, all the time to be on, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I know now if, you know, I, I'm on. I can be tweeted, I can be anything. Uh, so I'm in, in a mode which is different than if you, we had a conversation together, just with two of us or with 10 people. We've no, you know. So anyway, I'm super excited with Google Glass. I, um, 
I, I met them a few times to think about apps. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think what we're going to see on this form factor is it's going to be amazing. I can't wait for mine on Monday and I'll be bragging with them. Um, but um, that's one. The other one is um, the sharing economy, mm -hmm. which, uh, which I've studied literally. Um, and uh, I, I think when you look at Airbnb and the way it transforms, uh, it, it's the number one competitor of the whole hotel industry in the world. And those guys did not exist three years ago. Insane what you can do today. And uh, thanks to social. And what happens is a conjunction of mobile um, and, and, and social local mobile, which we had as a theme at, at the web, but it's, it's mobile plus social and local. So, so I give you an example. The social part gives you trust. Like there is this French service called, uh, I invited them at the web, Blah Blah Car, and they do hitchhiking. Right? And hitchhiking is dead. Why is that? No one would do hitchhiking because you're scared to go in a stranger's car. You don't know how they drive and so and uh, and and um, I, I would be scared to get someone in my car that you know has you know, I don't know, and then they restore trust by you using Facebook because if you're a friend of a friend, then right, I trust you. Why not? Uh, back to the expert conversation, it's kind of the same. And and so uh, I, I think this is the, the shift at which we have with the trust created online. Again, back to the, the online reputation, is going to enable services. So. Anyway, with blah blah car, they do hitchhiking and, and it works because of Facebook and, and the trust that you have here. Is uh, we're seeing totally new services. I give you another example which I really love, and I'm not an investor, unfortunately, I would have loved to. It's too late. I'm actually an investor of a fund that invested in them, so I, Almost. it's called Poshmark. Um, and Poshmark is, uh, you of course, all know Instagram, and it, so it looks like Instagram, and it's an Instagram for your closet. So it's, it's for a woman, men don't give a damn about that. So you, you take your phone and you take a picture of your shoes uh, or, or you, your uh, uh, necklace or bracelet and, uh, and, and you upload it. And it's, it literally looks like Instagram. Take a picture and uh, other women will come and comment and like. And so there is love happening already. Like, oh, I really like your shoes and so I don't get it, but they do get it very well. And they talk. And, and then you set a price because you don't want the shoes anymore. You, maybe you don't, you, you, or your handbag, your, uh, your Chanel handbag that you don't use, right? You take a picture and you say 200 bucks, whatever. Uh, and then people can buy it, negotiate, but, you know, so 100 percent mobile. Study it if you want to launch a startup, Poshmark, P-O-S-H-M-A-R-K. I wrote about it on LinkedIn today and uh, because I was so impressed. They upload $1.5 million a day of clothes. This is a, a, an average uh, U.S. fashion shop, I was told by uh, Manish, the founder, every half an hour online, every half an hour, all mobile. And, uh, and by the way, the guy is the happiest man in the world because he's, uh, first he had this idea which is only for women, which is kind of weird. And two, you get in his company in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley and it's him as CEO and 49 women who are all about fashion and you know they're all like talking about like they all look pretty and it, it's so this is going to be a billion dollar company so here's my point I think there is a uh, an incredible trend of things going mobile working with a sharing economy this is sharing right uh, with a community around it no marketing bullshit there is no marketing bullshit there it's all women talking together they are trying to get out of the way as much as possible are not trying to put banners and everything you learn in digital marketing is wrong. No banners, no, I'm going to make a lot of friends. I, uh, it's, it's all about community. If you get the community, you get the rest. If you try to push things, and it's difficult. So, so those are the two trends I really like, but I could go on for two hours. Um, since you talk about women, um, my next question is, why is there less women than men in entrepreneurship, according to you? You can tell me. Well, I'm asking you since you're, you're looking at Valley and stuff, what, what's your point of view on that? I think it's a shame, and at the web, we always yeah, We agree to... on that, but the reason... Yeah, yeah, no, there is girl in tech and woman in tech, and there is a lot of, uh, you know, Sheryl Seinberg just wrote a book that is the number one in sales in the U.S. And, 
um, an incredible woman in technology. But uh, that's not the question, right? The question is why? I, I, I really don't know. Maybe they uh, like technology less and they're more yeah, but interested. But even in... entrepreneurs in general, not in. Oh, not entrepreneurs in, in general? Huh. Are they too busy being entrepreneur in their personal life? Uh... Okay. That's your answer, the final answer? No, I mean, creating a family is, a, is an entrepreneur program, right? Yeah, but it doesn't have to be only the woman, right? Yeah, that's, uh, you got me here. Yes. Um, well, I didn't mean this as a feminist uh, comment at all, by the way. I'm getting deeper and deeper now. Um, I should have really not tried to answer that question. Fine, you've got... You've Thank you, Penelope, for asking the, or whomever asked that. Well, actually, that was my question. I have to oh, okay. Well, that was by design then. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think uh, we need more of that. Okay. <laughs> Great answer. Um, so, um, other questions? Um, yeah, some people ask, if you were an HSC entrepreneur today... How uh, do you ask a question like that? Well, actually, you just, yeah, didn't you listen to the speech I made? Oh, you said that at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so let me remind you. No, you maybe for both of you watching. Uh... Yeah, you can either send a text message. I think the number is up there. So it's 31035. Uh, or you can tweet by using the hashtag Loic And it will appear on the screen. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so if you were an HSC entrepreneur, today, in which sector would you launch your company if you had to start today? Would it be the sharing technology. economy? Oh, you, you mean technology for sure. Uh, I mean, in, in I would do a startup, a uh, tech startup for sure, just because the, the thrill and the growth and the, like, uh, I don't know many industries where you can build an Instagram and sell it for a billion dollars in, in two years. Right? Mm. You cannot do that in many... It's just, and also have the impact of uh, changing the world. Like Kevin Seitz from the founder of Instagram has impacted the world in, in a unique way. Or Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, is, you know, and, and you can reach a billion people on mm -hmm. Facebook. It's amazing. Um, and and there, so this is so exciting. So about that, um, what percentage of his time do you think an entrepreneur should dedicate to like buzzing and being on social networks and stuff? That's a question. That's oh, question. You shouldn't try to allocate time. You should just try to uh, incorporate it as your daily, uh, your permanent uh, way of thinking. So if you, if, you, if you think about something that is interesting for you, share it. That's what I do. If you follow my yeah, tweets. But you can spend a lot of time on Twitter. It takes two seconds. Yeah, no, you, I, you read everything? Oh, no, I, I mean sharing. Sharing. So if I read something on, the, for example, yesterday I was on the Wall Street Journal and I saw this article that 200 billion disappeared from the markets, financial markets, for one tweet that was posted about a fake, um, uh, a, a fake, comment uh, dire, attends pas, fake. Je suis un peu fatigué. Attack. Attack. Fake attack. Fake terrorist attack. <laughs> Um, generally, it's the opposite. But anyway, 200 billion financial market valuation uh, lost for one tweet. And so anyway, my point is I shared it immediately because it's interesting, right? So if you think this way, don't think I need to promote myself on social networks. That doesn't work. Think, is it interesting for other people? And generally, there is a lot of interesting things you see. Just share it. Uh, links, you know, sharing links is a great way to, you know, you. Each time you see something interesting, then no, you cannot read it all. So uh, read people you trust and you think are interesting for you. So if your passion is fashion, uh, try to find 50, what are the 50 best Twitter accounts for following fashion? I have no clue. Um, and, and, and Facebook and, and, and connect to those people, follow them. Uh, what are the best sources, best blogs? the best news sources and so on. And I would do a mix of, of course, professional and amateurs. And, uh, and, then, just, and then share around that, because it will make you uh, uh, exist on that topic. So it's not about uh, how much time should I spend. It's about, I have no idea. I probably spend three or four hours a day at least. But um, it's just that if I find something interesting, I share it. That's a good way to think. 
And about blogging? Like I, you answer a mail, for example. Yeah. If you have a friend asking you a question that is not confidential, just blog it. It's, if it's interesting, or put it on Facebook. If it's interesting, someone else will find it interesting instead of answering just one person. I, I do that sometimes, I, or I used to do it. You, you blog it, and then you send the link to your friend. There is your answer. But a hundred people could see it as well. Okay. No, seriously. So, yeah, about blogging, uh, I had another question. Um, what do you think the, is the future of blogging? Do you see cha uh, trends changing or? The, the form factor has changed. Like, I don't use my blog much anymore, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of sad, but that's what it is. And I think now you have to, so, so the big trend is you have to be everywhere instead of being in a central place. Uh, and I am actually not on uh, my blog uh, at all. I always try because I think it's sad, but uh, I felt, for example, I, I blog a lot on LinkedIn today, these days, just because they uh, put me in this thing where they feature uh, uh, the, the blogs with a few over 100 people. And they put you on the homepage of LinkedIn, which is kind of cool. So you go there, you know, and, and, and maybe there is a new place soon that happens. You have to be everywhere as much as you can, like uh, in a different way maybe. But uh, it's not, it's, I think blogging doesn't really exist as blogging anymore. It wouldn't say posting on Facebook is not blogging, but it is. It's my is it a real job, blogger? I'm not a blogger anymore. No, I mean, I'm not saying you are. No, I, a job? Yeah, you can make money blogging still. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, TechCrunch is a blog. It got acquired by AOL, and they're thriving, right? And the next web in Europe is a great technology blog, and there it's, it's a blog. So yeah, yeah, you can. Um, it's a great way if you if you have passion on something, to share on blogs. It's it's great, but now you need to. You, you used to be able to do only that, and now you have to sure. use Facebook and uh, comment in twenty places, and uh, so it's tough. So, what makes a blogger a good blogger? Uh, authenticity, no lies, uh, just uh, uh, controversy is good too. You say what you think, mm -hmm. and if, if people disagree, they'll tell you, and you answer. I, I do that all the time. It's fine. We you don't have to agree in real life you do not agree with people all the time it makes it all in, an interesting um, and, um, and, uh, and and so it's for, for example my, my own experience on LinkedIn today uh, because I, I'm just in it right now if you check I post there so that's why I think about it but there is uh, it's funny because in that group there is Jacques Attali as well and they show the audience of the post and he got not much because it's so boring Jacques Attali is boring What's there? What he posted there, you know what it is? It's old text that he wrote for Figaro or whatever two years ago that he will compact and put it on LinkedIn. I, I think he doesn't even know it's there. It's his team or, you know, that doesn't work. Uh, so if you put no. something more controversial where it's you, I have to feel it's you. Here's what happens, right? It's like the expert conversation. If It's me. Uh, and then you you can disagree, you can think I bullshit, you can you, whatever. But it's it, it's you. It needs to be you. If it's uh, flat, corporate, institutional uh, lies, uh, fake promises, you know, like most corporate blogs and um, uh, politicians are really uninteresting. Fine. Um, is there some question in the audience? Someone wants to ask a question directly. Hi. Hi. I know you've been interested in collaborative consumptions. What do you think about uh, collaborative creations? It, it's, it's not really started yet, I think. Uh, so the question was about collaborative creation versus collaborative consumption. Not versus, just different ideas. Yes, I think uh, it has not happened yet. It's going to be even more huge, and I'm trying to learn about it. So creative uh, collaboration and creation is, for example, a, uh, I forgot the name, but there is a robot that goes under the ocean that was created uh, in an open source way. Um, and anyone can contribute and uh, very cheap recreate a robot like this because there's a, those are people who have passion with exploring the oceans. And uh, you can just download it and, and build it yourself. And they created this together just from one idea of one person. And that, I think that's, that's amazing. So it's basically the open source kind of way of thinking the movements such as uh, Wikipedia at the time, 
but now applied to things. Uh, there is another example which is called WikiHouse. WikiHouse is uh, the open source of uh, architects and uh, house designs. And you download, so if you're an architect, you create a house instead of keeping it for yourself and selling it, you publish it there, like Wikipedia. And uh, someone in Brazil can, I don't know why Brazil, but you download the house and build it for very cheap. So I, I've read stories, that's why Brazil, that uh, it's in some favelas, they are tr starting to download houses and it's changing because it's so cheap to do. And so the cost of creation goes down, the cost of production goes down. Um, add to this 3D printing, where you can, they may give a demo of you can build a house, you can cut the parts of the houses based on what's online and with like super low cost to build a house because it's all open source. Uh, and there is no intermediary, there is no margin, like super, super low cost. And so I think it's fascinating and I'm considering uh, that the next theme for the web Paris should be makers, considering, because it's kind of narrow as well, so I don't know because we need to big, make big themes. But um, I think it's, it's incredible, it's the future. I look at it a lot. Thank you. Um, and I also have a question about your, your vision about 3D printing, because you were talking about that. Uh, I have no visions. No vision? No. Uh, 3D printing is uh, it's the same when you see someone. I'm, I'm a visionary about but No visions. Um, What's your point of view? Thank you. Uh, it's a tip. Like, no, it was a tip because we're students. We're students here, right? I think it's a good tip to be... Try to be low profile. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, 3D printing, I, I am learning about it as well. I think it's super exciting and uh, I actually forgot them. Oh wait, yeah I forgot them. But yesterday at the next web that conference, someone gave me a fake Google Glass made by a 3D printer. And I wanted to show up on stage with them. Oh. And they look like real Google Glass and are completely fake. And the re no one can tell. I mean from far away, right? You wouldn't tell because they look exactly the same. You have a little screen there. And so. And uh, yesterday they were all walking around in the conference with those fake Google Glass. This is so smart because uh, people would walk to it, oh my God, this is Google Glass, right? It's all fake. And they walk in the streets like that, right? And uh, they market a 3D printer. It's about yeah, you know, free. That's And smart. they printed 200 fake Google Glass. So I, I have them, it's, uh, it's fun. So I, I think it's a game changer uh, as well. I saw it uh, happening, it's going to be very cheap. You even have game, uh, 3D printers that can reprint themselves. So that gets a little meta, right? So a 3D printer can print another 3D printer. Um, <laughs> no, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating and I, I'd like to learn, but that's where I, I feel I should be an engineer. Okay. And I feel bad about just being a, a business guy. Because uh, if you get a free printer, what you'll need to have is, you know, plants and, and you know, to create objects, you need to download. It gets a little technical. Yeah, okay, it's I, not that easy. No. Okay. I, not yet for me, at least. Um, I have a lot of mm, people wanting you to talk about Bitcoin. What do you think about Bitcoin? I, I don't know. You don't know either? No, I invited them to the web. We have three speakers at the web London. And I'm looking forward to learning. That's how I learn. Uh, so I don't know yet. I'm very intrigued and I say I don't know because I'm not sure it matters that much. But when I see David Marcus, the CEO of PayPal, oh, some story by the way, the guy is a startup guy who is a friend and creates a company in Switzerland and he grows, he moves to Silicon Valley, PayPal acquires it and he becomes the CEO of PayPal. It's pretty cool, David Marcus. And he, he tweeted, I think, yesterday that he was considering adding, adding big Bitcoin to PayPal. So yeah, it must matter. I, I'm not sure yet. I, I, I want to, there's a lot of hype, but uh, when you see what happens in, in Cyprus, um, yeah, maybe there is a, you know, an alternative currency to be, to be made. Okay. Um, I also have a question about apps. Um, what do you think France is so far behind in terms of app development? Mobile apps? Yeah. Um, is it behind? Well, it is for the people. I don't know. I think... Uh, 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 the French reputation for engineers is incredible. Each time you go to Silicon Valley, if you want to partner with a company, try to find the French, and there is always French engineers. And I don't, I don't think, I don't know, I don't know what what's about 
French mobile apps under the block. I, I didn't look at that. Um, and for you, uh, what, what would be the right time to raise money when you're developing a web app? It's impossible to answer this because you need to look at uh, which app. Some apps don't need any money. Some apps will 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 be very you know capital intensive and need. Like if you take Path, you know Path, Path. Yeah. So so it's a team of Dave Morin. It's a team of like I think 30, 40 people. I mean it's a lot of people for one app, and they raised a lot of money, uh, probably because Dave could. Since he created the Facebook platform, it was easy for him. But um, and it's super polished, right? And you have no idea how much work they put into things to make it incredible, and uh, how much they work on the UI. So that's an example. And, and then you have um, really low-cost apps that, that do Marvel. So I, I kind of answer that that question. I think it's, uh, it totally depends. Yeah, but it's amazing what you can do with no means. Airbnb started with almost nothing. Um, I have another question that I got a lot of votes, so 28. Um, what's your point of view about the freemium business model for B2B companies? Precise question. Wow. For B2B companies? Um, great. It's great. No. <laughs> um, Evernote. You know Evernote? Who uses Evernote? Evernote? Of course, uh, great, I invested in it, so that makes me happy. Uh, total freemium model. They created this app that you store your you know, thoughts on. It's, it's, uh, my brain is stored there. And um, the more you use it, the more it gets addictive. And if you talk to Phil Libin, the founder, he tells you freemium is what makes it so sticky because people, the more you share on Evernote your thoughts, you store them, the more it becomes important for you because it becomes more and more of your uh, memory. And, uh, and you need it more. And, and so uh, if you started selling this immediately, you wouldn't have grown this way. You, you need to first make the users addicted to it. And they are completely, you get completely addicted by Evernote. If you use it, you start scanning. There is no paper touching me. If there is a paper, I scan it or I take a picture to Evernote. I don't want, and I trash it, everything. And, um, and, and, and then you add the premium. So you start selling for $5 a month, something. And uh, it works. It works great. There is Voxer as well from another friend of mine, Tom Katie. So Voxer is this walkie-talkie app. You should try if you haven't. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, he has millions of users. Same. He goes in companies, businesses now, who start to use it to collaborate, and uh, he creates uh, features just for them, such as creating a group within a large business. You need groups that you can kick out people from. You need to be confidential and so on. And um, um, I think it's probably the best business model for most uh, business okay. startups. A Dropbox, same. They started con consumer freemium. Uh, now they are all about making. You, you start freemium to make people addicted, then you monetize it. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably the best. It spreads. Right? Uh, great. Um, so, based on your experience about. Uh, do you say p pivot? Pivot? Pivoting, yeah. Pivoting? Yeah, pivot. Not pivot? I think you said pivot. But we're both French, so we don't know. Please. OK, so um, what are the clues that tell you that you have to uh, pivot <laughs> your company? Uh, I am an expert in pivoting, for sure. Yeah, and what's the point of pivoting that circle. much? If you circle too much, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, but I mean, like, doing a totally different business. Uh, either you have um, a great team that you want to, to keep, uh, which was the case for me. I, I really had a great team, so there is no way. It's kind of stupid to, you know, stop the business and lose the team. And, and so that was a reason for me. Uh, then you might have, uh, we, had, we had raised a lot of money. So if you have a lot of money, you pivot because uh, you, you can't, just because you can't. <laughs> Otherwise, you die. Pretty easy. And, and so, so that, that's... It's not the best, by the way, because sometimes you add up uh, uh, preferences, sh preferred shares, and, and, and you, you, add, you increase your... Uh, when you sell the company, what you're going to give back is higher. So you'd rather maybe stop from scratch and re-raise than pivot. That's not what I had chosen. 
because I, I really wanted to to be to to be a success. Um, you, I think you pivot when you don't get traction. So traction is the number of users. Does it spread? Uh, for seismic video, which was the first idea before we pivoted, uh, for video conversation, we picked at like 100,000 users. And the reason was not a technology reason, it was a human reason, that most people don't like to talk to cameras. Uh, they, they can talk to someone on Skype, video, but they won't talk to someone uh, in public because they are shy, they don't like their image, they think they look like shit, they uh, look stupid, and so on. Many reasons which are totally human factors that I completely had underestimated, I had not seen. Because I thought big mistakes you can make is to think that your users will think like you. And I don't have a problem talking to a camera uh, or talking to my phone and looking like stupid. I don't mind. Uh, most people do. Even my kids were making fun of me. That's not good. So it, it meant, you know. But it's funny because uh, I, I was pretty uh, interested to see, if, I don't know if you follow, but Sean Parker, the first investor of Facebook, a dude in the field, if you saw the Facebook movie, the social network. Um, created, uh, tried to create exactly the same last year called, uh, what is it? You should know that. Uh, uh, tell me, someone in the room knows. No? Airtime, thank you. See, the power of a crowd. Um, Airtime, he raised $60 million, I think, to do a video conversation exactly like when I saw his speech last year, I was like, that's seismic video. And you know what? It's already failed. I think, I mean, no one talks about it. I hear there's no team anymore, $60 million. Uh, anyway, um, he, if he would have called me, I would have told him, no advice, but here is why it didn't work for us. And, um, and it's human factors, so no traction. We did like this, boom. And that's not enough users that you can build a business on. So I had to change. Um, uh, the competition, the change in your environment, so then I pivoted into a, being a Twitter app, right? Because I love Twitter. I follow my passion. Sometimes it leads me in weird places. And, uh, and, and Twitter was just a pipe at the time. And they were encouraging the developers to build. And all the VCs and everybody was like so bullish. And it's going to be the next thing. And I really so believed in it. We were like day and night building on this. We became the number one, the most popular Android app on Twitter, uh, featured on Google, Android, and so on. And suddenly, Twitter said, hey, I'm going to become a media company now. And a media company makes money by monetizing eyeballs on, uh, with that. You guys doing apps, uh, we can't let you do that because you're, use, you're using our eyeballs, our audience. And uh, we were about to launch ads and so on. I was stupid not to think, not to see this coming. But um, it was a bet. And there you pivot because you're screwed. I, you can't do anything else. So you have to pivot. So we pivoted again. <laughs> okay, so so change in environment, no traction, uh, competition that you can't beat for some reason. Um, um, uh, a great team that you want to keep, uh, so you pivot instead of breaking it, or you have the trust from your investors and they want to keep building with you. So there are a lot of reasons. But if it was to if I had to do it differently, I would have probably um, not pivoted so much and then started all over again. Sometimes you need to start fresh. You know, it's like the uh, wine. You know, you have uh, two, like Cuvée 2000, 2001, right? And uh, if it's not very good, you'd rather wait for 2002 and market it and it's new. And uh, rather than like if I kept pivoting on Seismic all the time on my old company, yeah, it would be always like, Right, you better like stop and move on. That's what I'm doing now. So, what's your next startup? That's a good transition. I don't know. I, I it might be a Google Glass app, but uh, my problem is I really, uh, I what I really like with the web is that uh, there is revenue, <laughs> and uh, we, you know, just a few days before, like a few weeks even before a conference, you see the ticket sales. It's so cool. My my iPhone gets crazy. You know, it's all like boom, boom, boom. Revenue, it's cool. I like revenue. If you're a CEO, you like revenue. It's great, cash flow, revenue, you can pay people with it. You don't have to raise money with it. So um, 
I, I'm looking at that, and, and I, Google Glass will be for sale end of the year, beginning of next year. It's going to take a long time to get to the market. And that means developers won't see revenue before you know, two or three, I don't know, two years, um, maybe, if you're lucky. And so uh, that's not too tempting. It's very revolutionary, so which is cool. I, I like to do cool stuff. But cool and monetizable doesn't work always very well. Sometimes, and most of the time, boring and monetizable works much better. Like it's, you know. So if you do cool new stuff, so, so I'm, I'm thinking, I really like Poshmark. I'm, I'm obsessed in trying to find a model like, you know, which is mobile and social. So, so Uber, uh, you know, calling a car, great. You're at the restaurant and you see the driver, you have six minutes left, you can take your coffee, pay the, the check. It's so much a better experience. So removing friction is a good way to think. So I'm, I'm trying to think all day long, where is there friction in my life? Uh, in services, when you buy something, is there a friction you can you can solve, right? Um, a, uh, uh, I'm not going to quote his name, but a friend of mine, <laughs> because you will be upset, I guess. But here's an idea that he gave me that I should do. I, uh, that's another thing I do is I always ask people what I should do. And you get ideas, and he says you should do the Apple Store of groceries. What is that? Explain. Well, the experience in an Apple store uh, is awesome. You have uh, you have no, I don't know in Paris, but I guess it's the same. you have no cashier, right? The guy will, if you want to buy an iPad, he's right here with his iPhone, you want an iPad, boom, credit card done, right? And uh, here's your iPad. You don't wait in line generally, well, unless when they release it. But the experience is, is beautiful, it's all clean, wherever you go in the world, same experience. Um, uh, representatives that don't try to sell you something because the products are good anyway, so they don't have to. And you see all that experience applied to groceries. So think about it, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, great products, always the best strawberries, always, always the best cheese, always the best, best, best. That's good. You know, that's a good way to think. And you have so much crap in food that you know always you can always trace the farmer that has, you know, done this product and, and grew, how, how, how your tomato was, you know, grown and so on. And uh, I think it's a great thing, but then you start thinking, oh my God, you need stock and you need employees and you need stores and you need uh, like log logistics and whew, I think that's not a good, uh, not for me, but someone will do that. Okay, someone in the room? Yeah, it's an easy project. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we also have questions about, uh, well, obviously you've heard of uh, L'Ecole 42. If yes, you I, w with I was having dinner with Zeli yesterday. So, w what do you think about that? Incredible. Incredible idea, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, well, first, the promoting coding as young as possible, obvious, right? I don't know why, uh, I don't know why would anyone criticize this and I think there are two things that people should really learn very early is, is coding and English. Um, and uh, because you just need that. And we would have much less unemployment in France and other countries if people had just coding and English. Uh, because if you're an iPhone developer or an Android developer in, in, in Silicon Valley, you're going to make $120,000 to $160,000. Um, and uh, what's, what's the average salary of an HSA these days? Uh, 45,000. So you're going to make more than an HSA graduate if you know how to code the great iPhone app. Awesome. So um, learn coding, teach coding. So I think, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. It should be made compulsory in the Ecole Primaire as early as possible to learn coding. I think, generally, as they learn History and math, they should learn coding. The more colors we have, the less employment unemployment we have. Okay. How much do we have? Six percent? Was it the oh, best in more. French history two days ago? Top ever, right? More about nine, ten percent. Because we keep <laughs> training people in things that uh, in, uh, uh, they, we keep teaching them things that no one wants or needs. So did there is no jobs. Did Gavinia tell you a little bit about the yes. school? Yes. 
things that you can tell us? Well, you know about it. No, I, I love. He's a he's a revolutionary guy. He loves to do things different. I'm such a fan. I think he's a French Steve Jobs. Seriously, and I mean it. Is um, we are lucky to have someone like Xavier in, in France, and um, he he just says screw the system. He I cannot tell everything he said because that would be. But <laughs> let's see. Okay. It's only us. No, that yes, that's a good one, boy. <laughs> I can't. Can I say that? No, I can't. They will be upset. Uh. I, he's my friend. I mean, come on. So uh, no, he basically uh, it was about. Did you talk to the uh, Ministry of Education to do that? And you talk to them and get approvals and so on. And he answered, "That's the best way to make it better." <laughs> so and that's the, the advice. Like, if yeah. you have a great idea, just. Do it, you know, just and, and just, just stop talking about it, writing about it, blog about it. Just do it. Don't ask for permission. Like, don't ask. You know, Lyft. Uh, Lyft is the mustache. You know, the mustache in San Francisco. No, you're you here. It's uh, cars. You put mustache in oh, front yeah. of your car. L Y F T. And so it's basically anyone can become a taxi driver. Uh, that's they not, would that's get. Not possible. They would get shot here. Maybe in Moscow they would get shot. Here they would get uh, probably bad in bad. But so the taxi monopoly will explode like the music industry has exploded. Same way. Because consumers, us, we want to find taxi. And you cannot find a taxi in Paris. And then you find a guy who is not happy, complaining all day long, and, and telling you you're not going far enough. That's the taxi driver in Paris, right? So you need to fix this. The way you fix this is uh, the sharing economy. Fixes it. So in San Francisco, there is this service. You put the mustache in front of your car, and you get the app on your phone. And thirty-five dollars an hour, you drive anyone anywhere. You're a taxi. Awesome. And you sit in the front. You talk to the guy. It's like digital hippies. Yeah, we're cool. You're cool, right? There is no meter, no taxi thing, no guy who is not happy about his job. And uh, and there's someone who gets money, either pocket money for a student or a real job for someone who is unemployed. And he uses his car. I know, I know people who uh, they moved in their house. They moved into one room, so they put the, the entire house on Airbnb. And they live in one room, and then their car they drive people. Yeah, so they make revenue on everything they own. Basically, it's kind of sad, right? But uh, if you can, right? And and this will happen. It's. Um, it's a force that's that's happening right now, and I, I think this is this is great. It needs to happen here too. Well, actually, we have a question. Um, well, do you think that the sharing economy model is really possible in France? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Why, right why, after what you. Said. Why would you ask a question? Well, oh, you mean this? This is uh, we need to make the sharing economy legal. We need a legal. So today it's illegal. If you if you rent an apartment uh, by default, it's illegal to put it on Airbnb. In many cities, if you, uh, it's pretty illegal to, to become a taxi driver without a taxi license that costs what a million euros, something like that, nine hundred thousand euros, I think. Uh, I don't know, a lot. Am I wrong? A lot. One hundred fifty thousand. Still a lot. I'm I'm really wrong, but thank you. But uh, it's a lot of money, right? And uh, the problem is the government protects it because the city gets revenue for that, I guess. And so the whole. Well, it's because it's hard. You'd have to buy back all the licenses because Here people we. count on that to get their. Uh, so it's complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. And, and and the government cannot change that like this without pissing off the unions that defend. So the whole thing is screwed. But it, it, I think it will happen the exact same way, just because that's what people want, and you can solve it very easily. So yes, but I think the sharing economy needs a movement, and I'm, I'm participating in one. That is going to be launched soon, maybe at the Web London, uh, where the key players of the sharing economy will uh, encourage the citizens of the world to sign a petition. We hope with millions of people signing this to say yes, we want to be able to put our flat on Airbnb and our car, on, and then do the taxi driver and like do let us let the sharing economy replace the consumerism uh, economy. And, uh, and and we'll see, but I think it's a very powerful thing that has just started. 
totally started and the, the way of thinking will, will change. It's going to change because we have too much. That's my whole presentation yesterday. If you're interested, it's going to be published, uh, uh, my talk. But it's, it's, um, I think we, we're at a paradigm shift between the way we used to think about buying more stuff and owning everything into just being uh, using a car for two hours, zip car versus owning, no one wants to own a car anymore. You want to own your phone, but uh, it used to be a symbol of success, right? You drive a BMW and so on. And, and now you want to use it for two hours, who cares? Very different. And, and so things are shifting. Change, shifting, but we need a legal uh, environment that is uh, friendly and that's not the case yet. So to make it happen, you need to send four million people who want it as a uh, petition to the minister who can change it. We'll see. Um, is there um, anyone wanting to ask questions? Uh, I'm, I'm amazed you bared with, uh, with, with us uh, at this time on a Friday afternoon. Hello. Um, I have a question about crowdfunding. Uh, what do you think about it? Do you see it last long? And can you tell us about the opinion of the conventional Investors about crowdfunding, how do them see that? They are a uh, disappearing species. Uh, they are in danger, the traditional investors. Because um, if you think about Pebble Watch, um, the, that watch, you all know Pebble Watch. Well, if you don't, it's, uh, you know Pebble Watch? It's not a Pebble Watch. This is not a very sharing economy watch. But the <laughs> Pebble Watch, which I have as well, but my kids took it. Uh, I ordered three of them, they took them all. Sharing economy. Yes, that's why I don't have one. Um, it's a watch that you get your text messages and your email on, so you don't have to take it. It's like Google Glass on your wrist. So if, if, you get, um, you're, if you're obsessed about your text messages and so on, you get it on your watch. Anyway, uh, the founder put it on uh, Kickstarter. He raised $11 million. No dilution. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you lose a third of your company if you raise money, Jerry, or more. No, um, no board, no one to you know bother you. Uh, just customers. Okay, that's incredible. So yes, I think it's fantastic. There is Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, it, it's not only for technology. If you do projects in other uh, domains, like such as music, uh, Amanda Palmer. You don't know the story of Amanda. Just go to Kickstarter and search for Amanda Palmer. She could not get her, uh, she's a very, very bad, and she, she sings. And they could not get their, uh, their um, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired with the death like. She could not get uh, majors and the music industry to, to, to launch the album. And because they need a lot of people potentially to buy it, of course. So it would have gone nowhere. And she put it on Kickstarter, she raised $1.2 million from 25,000 people, 22,000, something like that, which is very new. Like 20,000 people to a music industry standard is zero, it's nothing. You don't do a, a record for that, but it was enough for, for them. And the way she did it was you can buy the song or the album for like a dollar all the way to five or ten thousand dollars, and you get the entire band play at home. So you pay. $5,000 in Kickstarter, she comes with the band in your home and she plays. That's for sharing economy. Incredible. And all the real fans get what they want, which is the band. No intermediary. She gets all the revenue. They raise $1.2 million. It's incredible. Now, I'm pushing it a little bit. The investors we still need they are incredible people, like uh, our fellow Jeff Clavier, who is uh, French in Silicon Valley, Softech VC, or Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn, and no, we I think we'll have still buff, but um, it's good that they have some competition. Anyone else? I'm happy to stay the whole night. <laughs> uh, my friend Gary V uh, did this at South by Southwest. I did it. He, he, I think he did a five-hour Q and A. Uh, but you might not be up to. Uh, well, there is a party afterwards. Yeah, no, yeah, I have a dinner too. But like, whenever you want to kick me out, you kick me out. I, I can be here for five hours. Okay. Hello. Uh, first, glad to be with all of you. All of you. Um, you said South by Southwest. I have a question about it. 
Um, but first, uh, I have two presenting me. So I'm working for Silicon Sentier, the company, French accelerator of startups. And I have to say to you, uh, you are welcome to uh, share your vision of the company. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be happy to. I've, I, I've heard great things about it. So when you want. Uh, my question is, South, so, uh, South by Southwest is a very, very nice event. And uh, I am from south of France, and uh, with sun and beach and water and a lot of many good things. And what steps to create a low web like event in south of France? So I was, I was born in Perpignan, so I know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, and I love south of France. And that's why I love California so much, because you get a lot of uh, south of France experience where uh, the weather is every day almost awesome and I can go kite surfing at 5 p.m. Uh, every day if I want. Uh, anyway, that's not your question, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you should go to San Francisco, try to work there for six months or 12 months, you will probably not come back. It's, it's great. Um, but uh, your question about how to do a low web, well, uh, why do you want to do a low web in San Francisco? Because there is no rain, like there is Paris. a festival in Nantes already, which is not South of France, yeah. I, I reckon, <laughs> but it's kind of in the middle. Um, but I think if you if you identify a need, just just start it. Uh, festivals are great. I would advise you um, before we break. I would advise you to look at uh, South by Southwest is awesome, but also look at something like Burning Man, yeah. which I went last year. Um, and uh, that is a life-changing thing, and 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 they are looking at expanding actually uh, uh, because they, it's the same thing we've been talking about, which is moving from consumerism into sharing. And and uh, Burning Man is the sharing economy, or even the gifting economy for one week at work because uh, you, there is no money, no money at all. I, I came with some cash just in case, and I came back with the exact number of cash I had because you can't buy anything. Everything is uh, gift uh, economy. And, uh, and, and there is no marketing allowed. Not a single brand for, and I answer your question, but for a week. There is no Red Bull truck and no Heineken uh, tent and no sponsored parties. Everything is brandless, marketing-less. Zero. Can you imagine that? I didn't know that existed. One week, what a vacation from life, right? One week, no marketing, no ad, nothing, not, not even your t-shirt. Like uh, if, you, if you wear a t-shirt with a brand, you look like a tourist. So you understand it very fast and you, you know, rip it off. Um, and, and, and so uh, my point is that no Wi-Fi, no 3G, so no time, no social uh, differences because like no one gives a, no one gives a shit about who you are. And you can get a Stanford teacher, uh, you know, dressed like if he was anyway. And, and it's very interesting. Um, you don't know the social level of differences, and that's great. My point now: you should try to look at events like that because um, it's um, they they call them something. Actually, there is a term for it. It's uh, transforming, transforming events because they. They are different. They trans. They change you. They are not conventional. And uh, you can do a low web in South of France, but you could also look at those events. Go there. You're young. You should. You should go. You can go even if you're not young. But if you are, you will enjoy, enjoy it even more. I'm young. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And, um, and 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 launch something like that. It's, it's all around the world. It's happening. It's basically. Uh, I, I call them the digital hippies, because. Uh, they, they are not hippies, which means that they don't think money is bad. They think money is okay. Uh, and you can make money and you can succeed. It's fine. It's not France. Did I say that? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, you can be successful. But they, are, they, they, are, um, they want to really think in a different way. Uh, authentic and uh, with traceability of products and, 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 and conversation and not being isolated and, um, and marketing sucks. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. Another question? Welcome you.
Hi. Uh, we've seen recently that uh, Twitter Music went live. Uh, do you think it's still a good idea to uh, try to start a business around uh, music sharing and music discovery on the web? Sure, you know, when Spotify launched, there was a lot of music startups already around. <laughs> and look at the success. So I think Twitter music is a good, uh, good idea. I've not spent enough time on it. Uh, but, but yes, for me, at least, uh, it's, I think it's a great idea to work on that because there is no, not enough music discovery, which is alternative to the, uh, the way that they give you the choices coming from very few people deciding what's on radio when you switch on your radio and so on. And this is all going to explode, uh, for sure. So I think Twitter music is a great uh, way to address that and uh, uh, to see what people really talk about. So when Daft Punk releases uh, the song, what, a week ago? Everybody talks about this on social networks. Do they need someone to air it on radio and decide? No, they, uh, they just have so much buzz that it's... Uh, it's enough. So yeah, I think it's great. It's just starting. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Thank you. Uh, so about big trends, uh, what do you think about the the hype around massive online open courses? Do 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 you think it will be a revolution? Will it be a business? courses in, in, in learning? Yeah. You mean open universities? Yeah. Edx. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's not open enough. Like for example, there is no reason why we shouldn't share this. Well, actually, it will be on iTunes U afterwards. Okay, cool. But we are sharing it too, live, yeah. right? And uh, my but point is... it will is, be shared by HEC afterwards too. Right? This is so classy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Um, aren't we cute? Uh, thanking each other. So, no, but I, I think it's, uh, it, it's uh, obvious. So, I take a, a parallel in something I know, which is my conference. Uh, we do something totally different since the beginning. We publish all the talks online on YouTube, all of them, for free. We uh, live, like this, and then on youtube.com slash the web. When we started to, and we publish this, we publish the list of participants. No bullshit, same. Here is who comes. Like, we don't, you know, we don't trick you, here is who's coming. The conferences don't do that, because one, they're scared that people will uh, steal their customer list, Publishing a customer list, crazy. We do that. We don't give emails, of course, because you would get spam. But we tell you this guy from, um, you know, Ben Paribas is coming, and this guy from uh, from Google is coming, and so on. If you're interested in networking, here you go. The talks, and I come back to the question, of course, but same, we publish them all. And people, when we started doing that, said, oh, but why will people come and pay a ticket at your conference if it's all for free? Huge mistake to think that, because the talks, uh, if they are interesting for those in the room, like today, they're, I hope, <laughs> they are interesting for many more online. Um, and if you do this, it's people watching on their phones, watching all around the world, saying, I want to go next time. So it's marketing. So I would say my marketing budget at the web, we don't do any campaigns. We might start now just to test, but we don't do. Then we didn't do it for 10 years, uh, is sharing. So back to your question, I, uh, I think universities um, and colleges and, and uh, schools are just scared, the same way event organizers are scared, that they st the world steals the content. And, uh, and, and you should think the complete opposite. If it's generally those who think like this are also afraid of the quality of the content. Like, uh, for example, at Asha there are no bad teachers. So that can never happen. But uh, there are some, come on. But uh, if, if you have, if, so if you have only great teachers, you publish everything. The, uh, the people will notice and follow the courses. It will advertise the school. There will more, more people will want to come physically. And then maybe they get to a critical mass online. They can start selling that online as well. But you like think Ted does this, right? Ted, yeah, to, to get the live stream, you pay. Yeah. We don't do that, but by choice. But uh, I, I think it's a, a, a change of... Uh, it's a change of way of thinking of the management of the schools that when they get what they, what they, the marketing they will get by sharing is going to be huge. Of course, if the lessons suck, they should die anyway because they, if, they, if they share and people will laugh at them, right? So here's what's going to happen. The best schools will share and it's happening already. Stanford is all a lot, right? Yeah, but if they share it, everything 
what's the point of paying so much to because you don't get the networking yeah so yeah the networking okay so, just, so leaving yeah. three years on the HSA campus is worth a lot because you get all those for you know what I'm talking about um, and those friendships you get for life right um, so that you don't get that's why we sell a ticket at the web people want to the more online you get the more people want to meet physical uh, seriously uh, that's interesting but it's 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 a fact that uh, we don't replace everything by online. So that, then uh, the interaction with uh, the, the teachers will always be better in, in face to face. And uh, but I, I, I um, what do you think about computers in classes? I was shocked. I went to a class earlier, actually, uh, a marketing class, and uh, very, uh, everybody had a computer and, and looking like this um, while I was talking. And if they had Google Glass, they would be watching the teacher. Yes. Well, here you go. You're right. Yeah, no, but it's. I mean, it's. I think it's a real problem to have computers in class. Well, look at the web. Look at the plenary of the web. The pictures. Everybody has a computer, or an iPad, and look like this. So sad for the speakers. I mean, if you look at the room with everybody looking like, and doing this, right? It's, it's very, very sad. And uh, I had that experience. I was not surprised. I, there was like what twenty students, are all like googling whatever we were talking about and so on, or doing something else, dating. But <laughs> um, I, it's pretty sad. Google Glass, yeah? Uh, uh, maybe we should like forbid computers in class? No, no, no. You can't. You, you, you can't. You can't. You can't, but there is a trend. There is a trend like, uh, well, again, I'm sorry to come back to that, but that even hit my brain. I, you know, I expect many things coming from that, for sure. You're doing it the web, but... Um, at Burning Man, there is no free G, no Wi-Fi. We're in the freaking desert. Do you like capitalism? Me? Yeah. Well, I have nothing against Oh, well, of success. All, everything you're saying, no, it's just saying, oh, Burning Man is great, you have no brands, Burning Man no is money. Not, no, I'm no like, it's Whoa. not against success and creating. It's arguably the most creative place in the world for one week. People spend a year creating art. And, 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 and building camps and it's amazing what people do and it's not about money. There are things that cost millions of dollars there that people just donate. They, they burn it. So it, it makes you think about um, everything. It makes you think about why we build things to keep them and look at them. Well, uh, if, you, if you make them disappear and temporary, uh, it makes the next one even more interesting because everything disappears, right? So that, that for example, made me think a lot. Uh, but I, I think there is a new... Maybe I'm completely screwed up, you're right. I don't know. But um, there is a new way of thinking which fuels all the startups. Uh, half of Burning Man is the tech industry in Silicon Valley. And Zuckerberg goes there and, you know, and tech engineers and so on. And, and they get a lot of inspiration by doing this for one week, right? So, and then you come back to life. Yeah. But um, it, it's, um, it, to create Airbnb, you need to think this way. You need to think a total stranger can rent your flat for one week. Three years ago, everybody would say, this is crazy. They'll steal everything, break your flat. And now it's the number one competitor of the hotel industry. Like, this is, and that's by thinking not about not thinking the same way. Okay, great. Um, well, do you want to give us a conclusion? I'd like to thank you, Penelope, for uh, uh, tweeting about uh, when are you coming to Paris to HSC and making this happen first. So thank you, Penelope. Um, and uh, thank everyone who made this possible because there is not only Penelope, there is uh, the person behind the question. Uh, yeah. What's her name? Uh, it's um, Laure. Laure. Thank you, Laure, and all Another the tech Laure. team uh, doing the live stream. I know they came uh, just for this on a Friday, uh, staying here until 8 p.m. So thanks very much. And finally, you coming half of a room from outside uh, to Jouy en Josas, uh, discover this great campus. And to the students, I, uh, for me, it was a great, uh, uh, great. I have to admit, can I admit that? Uh, being on this side of this amphitheater. Feels good. That was kind of a, uh, yeah, I mean, I was there, so it's 
great. And I really know now so to, to, to after the thanks. I really, really hope you try things. Don't forget. Don't, don't fear failure. It's okay. Don't listen to people who will tell you you will fail. Don't wait for the idea of your life. It will never come. Just start doing it. If you wait for the idea of your life, it will be a revolution. It will never happen. Just start doing it. And whatever you do, it will be different in six months. So it's okay. Don't spend time on your business plan. It does, doesn't matter. The only purpose of a business plan at the beginning is to sell it to investors. That's it. That's it. it, it no, it will not happen like this. You know that. So you, the way you do it, you take your business plan for, from a business case here, and you put some bullshit in it, make it look good. You know how to do that. It doesn't matter. It will not happen this way. The sales will not come when you think they will come. They will not come from the product you think will come. It will never happen the way you plan. I'm not saying don't plan, right? But, but it's much more by learning. My, my friend Reid Hoffman, created LinkedIn, said, um, if you are not ashamed of your product when you launch, you launch too late. So be ashamed of your product. It sucks. It's okay. It's there. People will start playing with it. Did you see what Twitter was when they launched it? It was nothing. It broke all the time. It never worked. It terrible. Still, you know, what it is today. So just, just, just do it. It's okay. And uh, feel free to, you know, uh, if I can help you guys. Uh, I'm at Loic. I guess you saw that on Facebook.com slash Loic. And uh, um, I really wish. Oh, by the way, you, you can come to the web too. I know it's paying. I, I apologize, but we do a, basically 10% of the cost for students, uh, which is uh, way at loss for us. Uh, and, and but we we like it to be a little paying for students because um, we get motivated students. It's like uh, 100 I euros. I was there. No, last you, were, month. you paid. Yeah. And was it worth it? It was. Okay. Well, good. Because we, Especially for the candies, because there are a lot of candies, and like no adults take candies, so we had like everything for us. <laughs> but the cost of but, uh, uh, participants... And a lot of other stuff, too. <laughs> the cost of the food is, is yeah. way above 100 euros. Just the food we, we serve. Uh, but, uh, it was so, 300. What was it, 300? Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry. It's very expensive to produce. I can give you my ribbon, you know. <laughs> no, no, square. It can be your card. You can charge. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much, and uh, I'll be around still if you want to talk. Thank you, Philip, and all the team, You're and I'll hope. Thank I you see very you. much. And thank you online. For that.